What is up everybody? Welcome to my new series. This is my first video of the compilation, the new series that I'm, I'm going to be making of um, just compilations of videos, whether it's inspirational videos or top moments of documentaries, the top 10 moments of the documentaries. I'm going to be doing um, I'm going to be doing documentaries and just inspirational vid videos, just compilations of documentaries and inspirational videos and just speeches and, and things like that, revolutionary um, knowledge and wisdom, revo revolutionary inspiration that, um, that will inspire you to, to you know, create change within yourself and around you. That's the purpose of this new series. And um, so yeah, this first documentary is called The Nature of or The Reality of Truth. Thank you so much for watching. Hope you enjoy it. And if you do, share it so that other people can benefit from it. Peace out, y'all. There's a story in the Bible about God providing manna from heaven, food to sustain the Israelites while they were wandering in the wilderness. But it never said specifically what it was. What was this manna from heaven? When I asked that question, I had no idea how much my life was about to change. First miracle that Jesus was reported to have done was turning water into wine at a wedding. The story goes that they ran out of wine and Jesus put a portion of the manna into the water that they boiled as tea. He told the waiters to pass it out as wine. So I call up Deepak and I said, Deepak, I got to talk to you. I go, I just found some stuff in the Bible that's not making any sense. I think I found some psychedelics in there. I think there's meditation. Like, wh what do you think? And he's quiet on the phone. And I was like, Deepak, are you there? And he's like, yeah. He said, uh, where'd, you, where'd you find this exactly? Like, send me what you're talking to me about. What do you want to do, Deepak? What should we do about this? You want to write something up? And Deepak was like, this is too important. He's like, why don't we have a conversation about this? Could part of the religious experience have to do with plant sacraments? In Deepak's tradition, the mystery plant Soma was used to bring people to communion with God. Could have been that the hymns of the Rig Veda were actually sung to this plant which had no seeds that uh, had no flowers, that was really mushrooms. There's a scene in the movie Noah starring Russell Crowe where he has a dream that he's underwater with animals floating past. He wakes up knowing that God wants him to do something, but he doesn't know what. He goes and sits with the wise man in the cave, played by Anthony Hopkins, who gives him some psychedelic tea. He drinks it and has a detailed vision of exactly what God wants him to do. First of all, that's a possibility. Yep. Secondly, why does our brain have receptors to these things? Well, because we are part of the same nature. You know, we're not separate from nature. Science is based on a subject-object split, on a separation that is artificial. Me and the universe, when in fact I'm also part of the universe. Oh. So the same electrical storms that create thunder and lightning in the sky create synaptic firings in my brain, which creates thought. Mm -hmm. We are part of a wholeness. And what, what we call today everyday reality, which we take for normal, okay? Mm -hmm. There's war, there's terrorism, there's global warming, there's social injustice. 50% of the world lives on less than $2 a day. The environment is totally screwed up. And we say this is normal. Yeah. It's psychotic, mm -hmm. right? And it's psychotic because we have created it. What do you think it would take to break through that boundary at this point? I mean, here we are in this 21st Let's century. Party. Let's have a party. We'll bring everybody down to Peru then, and enlighten yeah, them. Yeah, and put some in the pot and let's drink it. Amen. Amen. Did Deepak Chopra just tell me to go down to Peru and drink ayahuasca tea, one of the most powerful psychedelics known to man? Still dazed by what Deepak had recommended, I bumped into our friend Jerry, who had generously loaned us his beach house for the interview. I was curious what he thought about what Deepak said. I didn't realize at the time, but Jerry's world was spinning out of control. Despite having sold his company for almost $100 million, 
Jerry was abusing drugs, drinking a lot of alcohol. His family was in shambles. And he was basically trying to kill himself slowly. More than I realized, Deepak's words were really sinking in. At this point, you might be wondering who this zappy guy is. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'd done everything society told me to do. Go to school, get a job, make a bunch of money, fall in love, start a family. I was living the American dream. I bought Beer.com for $80,000. A few months later, I sold it for $7 million. Here I am starring in my own Super Bowl ad. Life was becoming very surreal. Even though I had it all, my conversation with Deepak made it clear that there were other experiences that I needed to have. The value that I place on the experience is more important to me. So I always felt like I'd rather have a passport full of stamps than a house of a certain type. It occurred to me that like most people, I'd been searching for happiness outside of myself. And I was having the realization that I might never be truly happy unless I went inside my own mind to look for some answers. Albert Einstein famously said, you can't fix a problem with the same consciousness or thinking that got you into the situation. What this meant to me was that if I wanted to solve a problem in my life, or if we as a society wanted to solve some of the big problems we have, like violence, eco-destruction, addiction, depression, we needed to change our collective consciousness. Could society use some of these ancient techniques for its modern problems? I would if you only identify with the realm of three dimensions, if you only identify with the realm of the body, if you only identify with the mortal circumstance and the mortal experience, then to that extent, you are at the effect of those circumstances. Faith is standing on the conviction, standing on the knowledge and the conviction. There's something way bigger going on here. What we see is only a small portion of the total reality. See, we have three states, waking, dreaming, and sleeping. But beyond that, there is a state where it's neither of these three. But there is a restful alertness that dawns deep within. There's nowhere where we escape from being energy, so we're always energy. What we see as it looks physical and material is actually the reflection of light, photons of light that hit our energy and bounce back. So we're reflecting light, but we're reflecting it as a force field, a tornado of energy. If we can stand within the unreal world, the ultimate unreal, that appears real, that seems limited by the laws of time and space, and yet have faith in the realm beyond, that literally invokes that realm into being. It seemed like what everyone was saying is, reality's just a concept. I needed to have the direct experience of going inside. Could ancient wisdom have included plants and meditation? I was excited to learn that a lot of celebrities, people like Jerry Seinfeld, Martin Scorsese, were doing this meditation for a long time. And recently, people like Oprah Winfrey and Dr. Oz and Katy Perry had taken up the meditation and it seemed to be making them even more creative. I wanted to see if some of this ancient wisdom could help me to tap into my creativity. In the 1960s, a funny little man named Maharishi Mahesh Yogi came out of the Himalayas to the United States and he wound up teaching his transcendental meditation technique to the Beatles, and the rest is history. Today, there are more than seven million people worldwide doing transcendental meditation. What I like about the TM technique is that there's no dogma attached to it. It's really just a simple technique of silently repeating a mantra to yourself, which causes you to transcend into your quieted mind to subtler and subtler states of consciousness until a point that you reach a place called universal consciousness, an endless field of energy that connects all of us 
where all knowledge is contained and where everything is manifested from. Waking consciousness is all about being aware of something, this, that, this concept, that person. Mm -hmm. Transcending is leaving all of that behind to isolate and experience the self itself. It's blissful. It's not the end of the story. 10, 20 minutes of that is enough. The idea is to come back into activity and increasingly integrate and stabilize the experience of inner reality, inner silence, along with outer reality. And that's when life really gets to be interesting and fun. The mind has two aspects to it. It's the brain, it's this which is very concrete, you can measure it, you can touch it, but it's interacting with this field of consciousness. And what they come together is our individual self, our individual personality. And that's what most people think they are. I'm five foot eleven, I have this education, I'm this part in society, I have this amount of money. But it's not fundamentally who you are. And to know that, you need to have the experience of that. And that's where meditation experience comes in. was found that square root of one percent in some cities here and there and there and it does create positivity in the atmosphere in the tendencies of the people what excited me about this was that if we wanted to change global consciousness we only needed a critical mass of people tapped in when i found in the bible verses that said be still and know that i'm god the kingdom of heaven is within that's what the meditators are saying. It's so obvious, it's right there. The, the Bible is saying, meditate. Filmmaker Foster Gamble's documentary, Thrive, shattered many of the myths that we've been presented by regular society that keep us slaves to our so-called reality. So it seems to be a natural inclination to alter our consciousness somewhat. And I think one of the reasons for that is when we alter our consciousness, we can see our daily consciousness in a new way and it shifts, tends to raise and expand our daily consciousness. And to me, that's the point. And if we can use substances, whether it's broccoli or ayahuasca or, uh, you know, C-sharp major, <laughs> to give us a glimpse of what's possible for human beings and specifically, what's next for me? What am I ready for? When my consciousness separated from my body, it changed the paradigm entirely. I realized aha, there's something more than this meat vehicle that we have. And that one realization set me off writing all night furiously <laughs> until the dawn, and it just reevaluated my whole philosophy. And from that point on, I've been on a journey of experiential spirituality, finding the answers myself, and the plants have been the greatest teachers in that quest. Kundalini yoga icon Gurmukh teaches many celebrities how to journey inside using the Kundalini technique. She had her own experience with mind-altering energies. I do not regret anything I've ever done. You know, people say, I did drugs. I said, well, so what? It got you here. Forget it. I've met other people that I wish they had because I feel they can't go through the barrier. They can't go into that sixth dimension. However you want to look at it, it's going to be the unknown. And you have a choice, fear or faith. You know, faith that you're going to come out all right, that the lessons are going to be valuable, and that the medicine will guide you. Or fear, fear that something else is going to happen. It's going to be the unknown either way, so might as well choose faith. There are times in life where through different means, and God works in mysterious ways, we're shown the mountaintop. It's like through grace. It's like the hand of God lifts us up and just shows us the mountain. I owe um, a definite debt of gratitude to uh, my experience with various substances. I can't endorse it unless you're at a certain yeah. space in a certain environment with certain true healers because it can run havoc, just like LSD did. Yeah. They are people. If anybody has the right intent to want to go to their own spiritual uh, insides, the psychedelics are Wonderful for them. Wonderful. Would you recommend that somebody yes. looking? Yes. So seekers should go 
find a shaman. Sure. And go down and... Sure. Sure. That was it. I was going to gather up a group of friends who wanted to take the risk and go as deep into our minds as humanly possible. You just seem to be falling in place, you know. Uh, it feels like it's guided. It feels like it's meant to be. So for me, I'm just letting it go. You know, I just assume every miracle that is going to happen is about to happen, and I should just kind of enjoy it and uh, let it happen. I have chosen to work with the mesa, which is medicine bundle, meditations, rituals, um, counseling and working with ancestral medicines such as Huachuma or San Pedro, which are ancestral medicines that have been used for over 5,000 years in the Andes of Peru uh, by pre-Incan cultures who were masters of accessing dimensions of consciousness that are so deep that we often don't access. You know, I feel like it doesn't matter where in the world you go, it's like you'll always find, you know, your kind. And um, when it comes to spirituality, I, I respect anything that, or anyone who kind of walks respecting the planet, loving nature and opening their heart to, you know, the universe and love itself. As long as that's the main priority behind your religion or your, you know, ceremonial spiritual belief, then, you know, I'm down with you. I've got a few intents. Some are very personal, which I'm going to try and bring back to my family and loved ones. Um, and try and take some of that knowledge or the glimpse of the other dimensions that are out there, which I've been trying to do kind of in artificial ways. I mean, sometimes with my own artwork and my creativity, but in other ways with less natural things and sometimes that's an anesthetic for pain or just your day-to-day -day life that gets you down but um, yeah this is something that's been calling me for a while to come and do this but it hasn't been the right moment in my life and so it all seemed to just fall into place naturally I'm here to have sort of like a rebirth um, to you know tap into a, a place that I've I guess I've never gone so I don't know where that is, I don't know what that is, but hopefully it's, it's a good thing and, and, I'll, and I'll be able to get through it. When you drink the medicine, 50% of the medicine's responsibility is to do all the healing, all the cleansing, all the awakening, all the clearing, all the harmonizing that it needs to do. But the other 50% of taking it further, of taking it deeper, is always yours. Part of my, my uh, work, in this is to make the most gentle transition possible from being very sleepy to being fully awake. <laughs> really looking forward to tapping into some of those guys' stuff upstairs. My full intent coming down here, my macro intent was to try to share with everybody in the world for that matter um, the fact that there's different ways to see reality and that we sort of in this moment of chaos need to take a step back everybody and you know just try to see things a little differently the only way that you're supposed to fulfill your role is by being yourself that is the heightened you you attract more love and you attract more energy one of the, one of my intents and one of the things i asked for was to face my fears and i realized that no, I don't need to face my fears. My fears are not going to go away. First, I have to accept myself with my fears. Each person have a pattern. And that pattern is 50% woven by the person and 50% by the divine. Ayahuasca is capable of changing that whole pattern. From being one person one day, the next day you're completely another person. I'm open to light and love and just good vibes and anything that isn't on that vibration or frequency, I'm just like, I don't even see you, you don't exist. So that's how I'm walking into this ayahuasca trip. I'm just in a very receptive place. I just, you know, I know what I'm about 
I know what I stand for and I know what I resonate with. And, you know, I just, I just hope to walk that path. And, you know, whoever's walking on, along that path, you know, I hope to meet you and we can join hands and, you know, take this trip together. It happened for me in my ayahuasca experience when I was sitting there and I realized that I had just died. As I was looking at death and experiencing death, I saw how dynamic it was and how much was going on. And I realized that I never needed to fear death again. It was totally liberating. And as I spent time in this ayahuasca experience, I realized that I was sitting in a place where I could ask any question. I could go into the future, I could go into the past, whatever I wanted to know. I'm gonna ask a big question. So I decided to ask, why do bad things happen? And immediately upon asking that, I was ripped out into the edge of space, back to where when you're a kid, you go, yeah, but what's past space? And people go, oh, more space. And what's past that? More space. I was out there on the edge, looking at everything in the universe basically contained, like God would look at. It. And as I'm looking at it, Spirit said to me, you see that? It's totally balanced. It's perfect. And I looked at it and I was like, wow, that's true. It's totally balanced. It's perfect. If something happens over here, it'll just be made up over here. And as soon as I had that realization, I was sucked right back in. I was sitting in the room again. And as I was coming out, I just started to laugh. I was laughing and I realized that I had just gotten the entire human cosmic joke. Here we are with God, the man with the white beard and Buddha and Muhammad and Jesus, all these men. And I was with God and it was a woman. That has stuck with me every day since my ayahuasca experience. For me, Ingesting the medicine was uh, a destruction of everything I've ever known, everything I've ever believed in, everything I ever thought was true. I tried to reason it for a while, the two days um, after. Try to reason the idea that it's a hallucinogenic drug, Michelle. It just, you know, it takes things from your subconscious and projects them. You know, there's absolutely no way that there's any truth in what you envisioned. Um, that it's, it's, it's just a trip. You know, you read tons of books on alchemy, you know, you have tons of, you know, information about symbolism and religion deep embedded into your brain since you're a little kid. But I know in my heart of hearts, it's not true. And that everything that I have ever known could quite probably be bullshit. <laughs> and uh, it makes me happy.